Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, we still have uh, people logging in, so we're going to give everyone uh, some some time to get settled, and then we'll get underway. Thank you for joining us. Pink. Can give you a couple more seconds. I think we can, we can start. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on um, a, in session um, Artificial Intelligence Creative Tool or Existential Threat. We have um, over 600 guests from um, 30 countries joining us today. Before I introduce you to our esteemed guests, Adrian, Jessica, and Michael, allow me to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link to the recording after the event. Uh, we will also invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A button on Zoom. Please use the chat button only if you have any technical difficulties regarding the webinar. Um, we also aim to have a very interactive session and we'll uh, introduce polls uh, during uh, the talk. And you will be able to submit your answers um, online and also have the ability to upvote any interesting questions submitted. Without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Adrian Sonesy, Jessica Helfand, and Michael Horsham. I'm going to hand you over to Adrian, who's going to start today's conversation. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I was going to say it's very nice to see everybody, but of course, I can't see anybody apart from my two fellow guests. Um, but I'm assured there's people there, so hello and welcome. So I'm 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 going to let Michael and um, Jessica introduce themselves, but I just wanted to thank them both for taking part in this discussion, and a, a special thanks to Jessica for the uh, the portraits of the three of us, which you might have seen, um, and she dealt very diplomatically with uh, an outburst of male vanity from me. So Jessica, thank you. Um, but before we dive into the dark matter and bottomless pit of AI, I'd like Jessica and Michael just to quickly introduce themselves. Jessica, who are you? Thank you, Adrian. I'm the person who dealt with your vanity so diplomatically. Uh, my name is Jessica Helfand. and I'm coming to you today from the United States. I wish I were in London, but in fact, I'm six hours earlier in the United States. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Design Observer, and uh, I'm, I'm a writer and a painter. Thank you. Michael? Uh, I'm Michael Horsham. I'm a, a writer, designer, maker, um, part of the Tomato um, Collective. Um, I, I trained as a historian originally, then joined that, learned a lot, um, still working, still collaborating with uh, some of those people as well, and um, looking forward to this. Great. Well, thank you both. And um, my name is Adrian Shaughnessy, and I'm a graphic designer. I'm a design writer. I write about design sometimes for Jessica's esteemed blog, um, Design Observer. Uh, and I've taught at the RCA now for, I think, about 13 years. Um, I'm also a publisher, and I publish those old-fashioned, non-artificial, and sometimes intelligent things called books. So let me quickly set out the terrain for this conversation. As everybody noticed, when Jack GPT arrived on the scene, it seemed that every journalist and writer jumped into print to express their concern. And with good cause, it looks alarmingly like an existential threat to writers of all kinds. And as we know, in the predatory world of late capitalism, if anything can be bought more cheaply, it will be bought more cheaply. Even if that means, as it usually does, a reduction in quality. All three of us have writing as part of our creative practice, so it's a real matter of concern for us too. But we're also visual practitioners, not to mention citizens of the world. And in this discussion, we want to concentrate on the role of AI in the production of visual work and what it means for artists and designers, especially those about to enter this brave new AI-driven world. We want to look at questions like, is it a revolutionary tool with transformative powers leading to enhanced creativity? Or is it a mechanism for replacing artists and designers with super intelligent and parasitic algorithms that's leading us into a landscape of cloned, culturally biased and regurgitated visual expression? Is it, for example, 
a useful visualization tool for the rapid prototyping of visual outcomes? Or could it be the soulless clip art of the digital age? In other words, should we as visual artists and designers be pessimistic or optimistic about the uptake of AI in our working lives? And what actually is AI? So that we don't get buried in technical details, we're using the term AI as a catch-all to describe programs that can generate images or text in response to written or spoken prompts. We're aware of the various other types of AI, large language models, diffusion models, etc. But for ease of discussion, we're using the term AI as a, as a shorthand. Um, and as an aside, I, I like this description that I came across the other day. Both of all three of us have been reading madly on this topic. And as Jessica said before we, we started to broadcast, it seems to change every minute. But I came across this quote by uh, Ivenyi Morozov, who's a internet intell intellectual and internet skeptic. And he said, AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. And he said this because AI relies as we all know entirely on existing information, existing data sets created by human beings. So it's not artificial. And because AI relies on an ability to recognize patterns and make predictions, it cannot claim real intelligence. He concludes that no machine could ever create Duchamp's urinal, an artwork that required a very humanistic blend of knowledge and emotion which no machine can yet, and I stress the word yet, can claim. And as another aside, we're being warned by uh, some very sharp-brained observers that the real threat is not from AI, but from AGI, artificial general intelligence, a vast leap in AI development that allows machines to actually think independently of existing data. The monster, it seems, is about to leave the laboratory if it hasn't already. Uh, and it's not as if technological advances are new in art and design. We've, we've, we've gone from cave painting to computer screens and at every stage, technology has provided a pivot for change. Michael talks about this in his excellent book, Hello Human, and gives lots of examples of how visual communication has survived, triumphed even in the face, there it is, yay, in the face of technological change. In the 16th century, artists used camera obscura and other optical aids to make complex compositions in oil on canvas. And this led to a new sophistication in representational art. Photography itself was another disruptive technology, but we still have portrait painters. And rather than killing painting, photography led to a revolution in visual art where artists turned away from representation resulting in cubism, abstraction, conceptual art, and a torrent of other 20th century art movements. Mm -hmm. And if we come more up to date, I can remember the dog whistle that accompanied Apple at early Apple advertising. Apple implied that the new Apple computers running graphic software, PageMaker, remember PageMaker, meant that publishers could do away with pesky graphic designers and do it for themselves. But the opposite happened. Graphic designers adopted the new computer, and there are now more graphic designers than potholes on British roads. If you're a cyclist in Britain, you'll know what I mean by that. So does this mean we accept AI as just another technological advance to be assimilated like all the others? Or is this a technolo technological advance on a scale never before seen in human history? And it's not as if there aren't many dire and apocalyptic warnings. An Iranian Ayatollah has issued a fatwa against users uh, of what he calls satanic AI. Others predict a catastrophic impact on labor markets, and yet others warn against an assault on democracy itself, as if that's not happening already. And for some, the singularity, the moment when the machines take over, is already upon us. So we're restricting our conversation to the visual arts and to three main areas creative potential and danger, ethical considerations, and we'll try and, if, as long as we don't go on too long, we'll try and look at education as well. So what are the creative potentials and pitfalls? What are the ethical considerations? And how does this fit into contemporary education for artists and designers? So 
Jessica, I'd like to start with you. You're using AI in your, in your work. Can you talk about what it means for you as a, as, as a creative practitioner? Well, thank you for that long and beautiful and eloquent introduction. Um, and that is a hard act to follow. Um, I, I like that you talked about dog whistles because I don't think that's what we're here to do. I think we're not here to naysay and point fingers at what's wrong. I think we're here to actually ask more penetrating questions of ourselves and each other and um, interrogate some of these assumptions. I was reading earlier today that, that the question may not be about the artificial, but about the intelligence. Like, what is intelligence? And I'm so interested to have Michael here to talk about his book as it relates to this topic, because these questions of moral thinking and having an actual stake in something that has to do with something more than what is predictive, I think is actually key to where the human um, modality might be missing in some of this. There's no doubt that this is a seductive medium, and it has been seductive for me. Um, you know, uh, you were also talking about how how different art forms over over time have we, empirically we've thought that each one would uh, eliminate the other. And I was reading recently that Baudelaire uh, famously pronounced the then nascent medium of photography, I think 170 years ago, as the mortal enemy of painting. So again, this idea of mortal and morality uh, comes to bear on what we're doing. So I'm a portrait painter and I work from photographs and I think uh, that the history of portraiture very much resides in the idea of the zero sum game, the perfect portrait, the most perfect idealized personification of the human uh, countenance. And what I'm finding with the rapidity with which I can test angles and lighting and material and uh, sort of almost morphology of, of, a, of a sitter is, uh, is remarkable. Uh, but I always come back to the judgment and the eye and the observation that I think is key to what makes me the kind of painter that I am. So it's a kind of an adjudication and an editing process. Um, I like the speed. I hate a lot of, of what AI gives me. As a friend recently said that looking at mid journey is like being stuck in a bad high school art show. So 90% <laughs> of the time, what it gives me is really implausible. We all know that it doesn't do well with fingers and toes. It doesn't do well with certain facial features, but if you know your subject and if you as a maker and we all are makers think i think ruthlessly objectively about what it is we're making this additional flavor and i'm not going to call it a tool because it is almost like an additional kind of set of conditions i think can bring enormous um new opportunities to somebody uh working in all kinds of studio practice for me it's painting but it can easily be graphic design it can be architecture i think the things that are going on with ai in terms of set design and and speculative design scenarios are really fantastic but without the heart and soul and mind and pulse and morality of the maker i think we really will be doomed that's the only dog whistle i'm going to sound okay well that, that's a good point to turn to Michael now. And Michael, you in your book you make a strong case for retaining the primacy of emotion and humanity. Yeah. Um well I try to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh good. Thanks. Uh I yeah, it's it, I'm I'm sort of intrigued by this because you know machines are obviously it's already happened. Machine learning in all its um iterations is sort of set to interpolate itself in every manner of, of production that we can think of you know so it's going to make things a lot easier to do I mean there's lots of ways we can go and I'm sure Jessica and you do this as well you know we could we could keep it analog if we wanted to you know get out the burns and the chisels and the the brushes and uh, the film and the chemical baths and the you know all the stuff that you you know that you use your hands to to make things with but I mean that I don't think that's really going to work you know because what well it, what it's going to be really good at and what it is really already really good at is is as we've already said you know the speed of iteration of things so you know if you're tweening an animation or or working on some sfx or or you know as as you said Jessica, you know working on something speculative it's 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 brilliant you know uh, and it's it, you know learning models are great ways of replicating and enhancing ways of working and making Thing, you know and i like the idea of it being a flavor rather than a tool but you know you kind of have to fire it up on the computer and it's it's got tool status as well as uh, flavor status i think but the thing that intrigues me about this is sort of flip it around a bit and it's it's really about how at the potential for it to be used to kind of read and map our responses to the things we make now that's all that's still part of a visual 
you know, the world of visual communication. And, you know, the eye works in a really particular, the human eye works in a really particular way. It works using things called saccades and fixations. Saccades are where it moves across a thing, fixations are where it stops on it. Now, um, that generates a pattern. And the way the eye does that is triggered by emotion and attraction. Equally, microfacial expressions also express emotion. And I mean, we're already in a situation where ne neuroscientists are uh, using eye tracking devices in order to map people's reactions to, to um, you know, kind of beta ideas for, for advertising campaigns, mm, yeah. strengthen the elements of, of an image that, um, that that someone might be looking at so i i don't think it's it's not that big a leap to sort of to think about machine learning being interpolated there um in order to generate images on the fly because it's yeah. learned the patterns of recognition that express certain emotional states and you know i'm i'm no conspiracy conspiracy theorist or doom monger but I find that a really interesting idea that the ma machines become the watcher of us watching the thing. You know, the loop is um, potentially, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, could we be designed out the whole process? I don't well, know. Well, the, the, the people who think that that's already happening and, and we'll, we'll, I think we'll, keep, we'll keep this strand for the, for the, when we look at the, the ethical side, because I think that's super important, but just, just to stay on the creative aspect, we, we know that all the ones I've looked at, they all work through prompts. Yeah. The journey being the, the, probably the best example of that. And, and I saw something the other day that the, the, the job of the future for art and des artists and designers will be as a prompt engineer. Um, and we know- I have a lot that, to say about that. Yeah, well, you, you'll have your say. <laughs> you, you'll have your say. Oh. <laughs> but, but clearly, Prompting and, and the ability to to, to to make good prompts is is, is a vital uh, an absolutely vital part of it. I just mm. wonder if there's a if it's so very different from being an art director, which is something I've done for many years, where you direct others um, and you have to get your prompts right. Otherwise, what you get back is is mm. is, is 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 of no use or, or of substandard. So I just wonder what you both think. Starting with you, Jessica, what, what do you think about this whole question of prompt? That's a fascinating analogy. And I think that, I mean, art direction was never about telegraphing what you wanted the person who was reporting to you to do, right? Any more than an editor would tell a, a reporter what to write. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea that you're guiding and you're choreographing and you're framing and you're doing all kinds of things that set the scene, it's what a director does in, in film, for example, is very different than the prompt. The prompt assumes it is language-based. And when I first heard this term, excuse me, I was giving a talk at um, a place called Caltech, which is like MIT, but it's on the West Coast, the California Institute of Technology. And somebody said, uh, do you know that the big new job opportunity is prompt engineer? And I immediately thought it would be a great job for a poet. And they said so, and they laughed at me because of course it is not at all about the lyricism and imagination of the poet. It's about the specificity of the prompt, getting you where you need to go, like search engine optimization. To me, that's a huge lost opportunity, right? I would like to think that we could encompass other kinds of nuanced uh, vocabularies in the way we ask for the results we're after instead of that incredibly diagnostic, to come back to Michael's word, which is the word in AI is predictive. If it's predictive, it's, it's, you know, it's using a map to get you where you need to go. And I think if we come back to what is, I think primarily our topic today and this audience, Sometimes the serendipity and the alchemy and the other kinds of forms of experimentation are much more for a student impactful, for the audience interesting, and likely to generate more opportunity for growth than constantly going after the large language model that makes you specific, that gets you to repeat what you've done before. That doesn't strike me as progressive. Hmm. Michael, where, where are you in the great prompt question? The great prompt debate. <clears throat> I mean, it's obviously at best it's a creative act, uh, and at worst it's a sort of, um, I suppose, a, 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 an iterative process of searching, um, you know. And uh, but your vocabulary, uh, both your vocabulary, your, your linguistic vocabulary, and your your technical vocabulary, you know, being able to describe what it is you want to see, um, is um, you know, to, to use Jessica's analogy, you know, it, the, the conversation between a the director and the director of photography uh, is um, 
it's often that sort of reciprocal back and forth you know can we try this you know and the dp will suggest the lens and the director will say no i kind of want it or unless he's worked unless he's wes anderson has worked it out all before um I, it, so i think it's you know it's a mixture of things it's creative act but the poetry thing is really interesting because it's science it's science and poetry together isn't it and mm -hmm. so it's 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 like um like a lab bridge. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I was just kind of a new word, I think. It's, it, 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 I mean, I, it, yeah, I mean, that sort of works for me. It's, uh, it's, it's something that's continually in the process of being experimented with, as it would be in a laboratory, but it is a language. Um, uh, I suppose the thing is, is what the relationship between the results and the language you use makes you do next in mm. that in that conversation you know if you start getting exactly the results you want from a very small set of prompts then you're most likely going to go further down that that hole right and and that may not be the best um uh sort of creative decision you know it's always great to kind of upset your own apple cart and surprise yourself in some way when you're working and, and the you know i guess the um the you know being locked into that kind of predictive uh, helper uh, in terms of uh, whatever um, app you're using to generate imagery um, that might militate against that so you know it's up to us again I think it comes back to the kind of human uh, emotion and dimension of it uh, the impulse to um, to make the humanity in it work make the emotion in it work you know bring the emotion into your prompt world yeah yeah but does AI take the emotion out of things I mean um, I, I just there's, a, there's, a, there's a question here. It's from Lisa Lis, Lis, Liskovoy. Um, and she says, and it's kind of, she's, she's following on, I think, slightly from what you just said, Michael, but she says, an important aspect of generative AI is the prompt or communication of the desired visual outcome in words. What mm. do you think is the impact of having language as a necessary intermediary for artistic and emotional self-expression? through generative AI compared to expression that does not have to rely on language. So, I mean, as my understanding at the moment is all the image generation programs um, rely on written language. They, they just as if you're briefing a, 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 you know, a, a model maker or some, a skilled uh, craftsperson, you, you have to use very specific language. Um, I think most of them do. Some of them that allow you to enter an image and interestingly, oh, the yeah. intensity of the image, right? So you can dial up. I'm going to take a picture of Adrian Shaughnessy, but I only want 50% Adrian Shaughnessy. You can mm. make these amalgamations, these kind of, you know, robotic, you know, monster like creations. But you can also say make the background darker. So yeah, language becomes a prompt, I think, later. But I think if the image is the primary thing and we are used to trafficking in images, there could be a whole other wave of this that is going to become i was reading today we were talking um just briefly about this photographer who won a big award and gave it back because he had generated this image artificially and he, he had this very do you remember what the word was it's a great word yeah. it was um and i have to remember it um but it was it was an amalgamation of photography and prompt language oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. promptography yeah. promptography yeah. right exactly yeah. thank you yeah. it's, prom prom it's a little earlier here for me uh, yeah. promptography and but i was uh, reading an interview with him earlier and he actually entered in things this comes back to our one the wonderful question um that's been asked he came back and he actually put in uh photographic terms like the f-stop yeah. and lighting yeah. conditions and so yeah. This is a photographer using his acumen around his field to actually enter data. So it's not really speaking to what the search engine optimization prompt reference points would be, which I thought was actually interesting. Mm. Yeah. But I want us to get onto this, the whole ethical question, because I think there's a real a lot to, um, it sits over this conversation because absolutely, the, 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 you know, it, it evade, it invades every, every part of, of, of the, the process, but I just wanted to, briefly get your take on on the quality of image you mentioned that sony photo photography award i think and i might be delusional here kidding myself but i think i could have spotted that that was an ai image and i i don't know whether the jury gave it the surprise knowing knowing i can't remember now whether they knew it but I, there was something about it that made me realize that, that it was 
AI generated image. So I just want maybe you both to reflect briefly on this whole question of quality. And mm -hmm. um, uh, a friend of mine, very a talented guy, Matt Pike, who runs a wonderful studio called Universal Everything. I'm sure many of the people will, will know will know Universal Everything. And a conversation. He's using AI, but he's he's doing what he always does. He's misusing it. He is mm -hmm. he's pushing it to, to to breaking point, as he does with with other um, software. Um, but he he used the phrase. Um, it's it's just like a it's it, the it's the visual equivalent of a covers band. Nothing I've never seen anything in 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 the whole range of visual AI that that, that I hadn't seen either before or could not be done by a good Photoshop uh, artist and and um, some of the so I just wonder what what's what are we getting here that's I, I think we've made the point, I think you both made the point, and I certainly can agree with it, that, that as, a, as a prototyping device, fantastic, instant iterations. But what about the actual quality of what you get? I've never seen anything that made me think, wow, that's... I, I have. Get the portrait of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have, uh, really recently. And, I, you know, I think it's it's sort of interesting when you're sort of moving through the world and, and you know... you. You have to deal with all this stuff and as we said it's moving really quickly and it's almost impossible to kind of keep a handle on it and you know i've, I've used it a bit in a couple of bits of work and you know to to jessica's point you know my my prompts were were to do with you know extremely shallow depth of field and that kind of thing i got some results that i needed um but then you know we decided not to use it because it was this you know it was just sort of hashed up by a by a computer uh, or by very powerful uh, bits of coding. But I saw a thing recently, it was by a guy called um, Refik Anadol, uh, who's an artist. And uh, he uh, was using, it's called um, Machine Hallucinations, this series that he's done. And uh, what he used was um, uh, images of Mars that were taken by the, the most powerful camera to have been sent into uh, to another world, thousands of images of Mars. And then there's a kind of a generative engine behind it that's animating this thing. And it sits in a gallery in a, in a, in a standard sort of um, frame, you know, in a, in, a, in a portrait frame, it's huge. And it's this beautiful undulating um, scene, you know, that's continually refreshing and animating. And it's quite mesmerizing. And Hey, what I loved though was not not. I mean, I thought the piece of work was brilliant, but he came up with this idea, uh, which I remember reading on the caption, which was that he he calls it painting with a thinking brush, hmm. and I think that that's that's uh, it's a really you know lovely poetic way of describing a a process, and that kind of hooks you in because it makes you feel that there's um there's again that kind of humanity and emotion behind it, and I think. Within this, within that idea of quality that you're that you're asking about, Adrian, I think that the thing that is, you know, the thing that's going to save us is 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 the artist. It's not the commercial. I think it's it's the artist. Well, it's going to be their job to to maintain the the humanity and the the meaning because all this stuff, you know, you're right. It's not intelligent. It's it's not artificial. It's just a producer of stuff. And the only thing that gives it to humanity is the is kind of what we're doing now, talking about what it means. Because whatever that stuff spits out, it has no idea what it means. And I think what you're we talking about infer the the humanity by inference, right? Exactly. I think what you're talking about is inference. You're talking about uh, interpretation and er, interpretability. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to this ethics thing, which I think is you're really getting to in an interesting way, Michael. Which is that nowhere am I hearing or reading or becoming more. Uh, drawn in by arguments around things like context mm. or consequence. Mm. So, for example, the thing that is was the most um, um, emotionally stirring to me about that image that won that Sony magazine, that Sony contest, yeah. was that he was um, messing around with history. Now, I'm somebody, I'm very interested in time travel, right? I've made portraits of my children looking like they you know, it's the 19th century. This fascinates me because I'm a social historian and a painter. So for me, right. this is that, right? But now think about Holocaust deniers. Now think about, you know, I don't know, um, anti-virus anti people. I mean, there's so much that we all, we know, we all know, and many of the people listening today know that, that our capacity to spin propaganda as visual right. makers 
is what we're, we're really good at this. And, and one of my biggest concerns about design over the many years I practiced it was that design can confer false authority on anything. Like in a way, the better you are at, at mimicry, the more you can actually convince someone to do something. Mm. Well, now that's actually a really potentially nefarious proposition. And I think when I read about, and I was reading, I mean, you know, IBM has an ethical mandate. Um, UNESCO has an ethical mandate. They're all around things like transparency, fairness, uh, accountability, inclusiveness, privacy, mm. security. I'm not hearing consequence, right? Mm. Consequence is the thing you saw in context, the thing you saw that stirred you, Michael, taken out of that gallery in a different place, trafficking in these unprecedented ways that we know that digital media can, that to me is the thing we need to talk about again and again and again. Yeah, we just don't know how things land for others. I think your point about propaganda is absolutely right because you know what we're talking about uh, in, you know, in terms of the industry, in terms of in, image making, art direction, you know, the the old jobs of advertising. You know, whenever whenever advertising comes into contact with politics, it becomes propaganda, and the advertising is an extremely powerful thing, as we know. You know, we've seen all. You know, particularly in the U.S. I mean, it's we're we're getting a a, a flavour of it over here in London, but but by no means as um, as um, I, I suppose you know, engaged as as opposing factions are in in the U.S. And I like to say, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> another the ability, word. <laughs> the ability to generate that stuff is, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I do reference um, Jordan Peele's um, Obama film from a few years ago, where he had Obama. He voiced it, but Obama was seen on screen, you know, calling Trump a, a dipshit and. Uh, and invoking uh, the the watching audience to stay woke bitches, bitches, which is not something that um, Obama would necessarily say, but it looked real and it sounded real and it was plausible. Uh, and it was only at the end, that, you know, the, the the reveal makes makes the point, you know, that that this is a potentially an extremely powerful political tool. Uh, I just saw something pop up in the chat about what our government has uh, a white paper that our government has um, just published, uh, yes. which. Which is anti-regulation, you know, which yeah, is I, interesting. I, yeah, there's some great stuff going in the in the yeah. questions, and I just wish we had time for every single one of them because they're all really good. Um, Caitlin here said the suggestion that a prompt engineer is akin to that of an art director is interesting, but with that in mind, does AI accelerating capability and output would this tool not price out junior designers from the workforce, leaving oh, them yeah. slowly stagnating? So I think I think these are very, so. very real 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 questions. Maybe the, the the heavier aspect of that is this whole question of it goes back to Matt Pike's description of um, these programs as cover bands. Um, the 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 whole question of it, nothing is originated, everything is scraped, everything is stolen, everything is grabbed. Where where do you both stand on that? Because I mean, in a way, again, it's what we've always done. All artists and designers look to the the past. They look to their peers, and we take, we steal. Yeah. It, it's it's how work gets made. And and if there was ever anything that was completely original, we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to see it. We wouldn't recognize it. Mm. But I just wonder where you stand on this whole ethical question. Can I just can I just go on record as saying I hate the word scraped? It makes it, it makes what we do sound like we're, we're we're taking biopsies without getting permission. You're not right. doing it, but Microsoft are and Google are. No, and, but I think I Google. think you know source material, reference material, research. But Jessica, right? this is this is naked theft. This is this is. No, you know, that's question. There there was an incredible story I stumbled across of uh, an an artist in LA, uh, and she she thought she'd look into this whole question of where this material is. Sorry, Jessica, where it's scraped from. And so <laughs> she did a, a real in-depth um, study of it. And to her horror, she discovered her own medical records. Being yes, used. It. Yeah, it's quite oh, it's wow. a well publicized case. And she saw when she when the photography, I think she had a, 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 a was it a brain tumor or something? Um, mm. the, the photography, when it was taken, she signed a document saying that um, she agreed to this, but that it would never be used. And there it was being scraped. Mm. So this is one of the, it's not the only one because we could look at surveillance and all sorts of things, invasions of privacy, but it is for artists and designers, it's a very real issue. Our work is being stolen. Getty have a, the giant, who I don't have any sympathy for whatsoever because they've scraped up everything, 
they paid. I really them. want. I really want that word retired from active duty. I know. All right. I won't use it. Again. I really. I'm gonna. I'm gonna okay. launch an international right. campaign. Right. The S um, word is the no. S word is no. done. But, but didn't mind. It's in the script. But some people are, you know, are, are, are really looking into are really looking into this. How can we get? How could be people who've had the S word done to them? How can they be re remunerated? All right. So here, I mean, I want to hear what Michael has to say about this. Um, this question of of you know labor, this, the rapidity with which we can generate things and labor and how, how jobs will be redefined. What you're talking about now, though, is this notion of authorship, I think, which is a, which is just a huge slippery slope. Yeah. Um, uh, IBM yeah. came out with this paper recently on uh, this idea of what they call collective intelligence. And I'm, I've always been very um, skeptical of co-creation. I think one person has one idea. Those of you in the audience who are students know it's your idea. You don't want somebody taking your idea. But they make the case that this idea of distributed authorship is actually a very modern conceit. It's a modern cultural, global, intellectual, digital way we live. And that they fold into this argument, and, and we should put a link to this paper, because I, I thought this was really well well researched and well done. The, the idea that, that the AI serves collective intelligence is, is a modern idea in the sense that we then credit the artist, but also the community within which, in, within which the artist was groomed. The education, the school, the, the the resources that came to bear on the making of the work, and it take it becomes in, in a really inclusive way of thinking about uh, authorship. That's that's not just you know co-creation and post-it notes. It's really like thinking at a community level in terms of who well, we are and how we we make things together through distributed networks. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think for me the co the closest analogy I found to it is sort of hip hop culture, really, where when sampling took off and, uh, you know, suddenly a huge industry grew up uh, around clearance of, uh, of using other people's stuff, right. um, you know, yeah. and, you know, that generated a, you know, a living for, for long forgotten artists in, in some yeah. ways. And, but they, but they found a way, the music industry found a way of monitoring that. Yeah, um, that's the problem. There is no, as far as I'm aware. Um, no, but I mean, anybody... you could do it. I mean, you know, the, Blockchain yeah. is essentially provenance. You yeah. could do it, and you don't. What you'd end up with with every piece yeah. of work is a the the equivalent of the end user agreement that no one ever reads on uh, whatever bit of software that you install. You yeah, know, yeah. You have this huge scroll of of everything that it that it mined, not scraped, but everything it mined in order to um, yeah. build it. You know. I, I think we're move, I think we're moving into the area of, of the, maybe the, the last issue to deal with in the old ethical question is who owns this stuff and and the, the the sad fact is it's owned by corporations who only have one objective in mind and that is is is, is the profit motive oh no 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 well hang on a second michael <laughs> the, the i just want to I, I, I want to hear what you're going to say but i of want course. to get and, and this raises the question of governance who is who is looking after this stuff absolutely we've got a we've got a poll question which joe right. if you're if you're still with us and you've got your poll software lined up, perhaps you'd like to, yeah, there she goes. So um, should democratically elected governments be more active in regulating AI? So we'll leave that one for, for the audience to think about. You, only choose Michael, one. you were saying. I was gonna say, what was I gonna say? It's kind of completely gone. Well, it's obviously <laughs> no, it's the, um, uh, you know, the idea that corporations are only after money and profit. They're, I haven't worked this out yet, but we're in a really strange situation where the where the people that are funding the development of these learning models uh, of whatever color are also calling for a pause on their deployment and use. So you've got, you know, Sundar Pichai sort of saying, no, this is really, it keeps me awake at night, this stuff, um, yeah. whilst paying the wages of the people that are developing it and releasing new models all the time. Yeah. And the thing accelerating. Well, look, it's really dangerous. It's accelerating. Now, I haven't worked out yet. I'd love to know if anyone's got an idea why they're doing that. Why they're saying it's, a, the it's AI washing. Busted. It's the it's the AI it's, called to greenwashing. They're just saying, hey, we know saying, we're, yeah, we know yeah. we're doing something potentially yeah. catastrophic here. Don't and blame us when it all goes wrong. Let's, let's step back. But you can bet that Microsoft um and the, everybody else that they're they're not going to hold google they're not going to stop for a minute because this is no of course they're not yeah yeah of course but, not. But, but but so i, I i'm skeptical of, of of voices which say i mean that there are genuine voices out there saying that um we 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 need to pause but 
we're not going to pause. Technology, no. technological advancement never pauses. No, um, there's, as you rightly say, money to be made. Yeah. Um, so I just, just, I was going to ask about about the, um, the 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 authorship question, but I think I think Jessica's very eloquently dealt with that. Um, mm. I wonder if there's. I wonder who's going to speak up for artists and designers in, in this debate. Um, I know Getty, as, as, as the Getty organization, huge, for those of you who don't know, huge conglomerate of, uh, of, of uh, uh, companies that own, um, uh, they own a conglomerate of, of small picture libraries. And they're, they're suing some of the big AI companies for, I can't use the word, but the S word. Um, I wonder who's going to speak up for artists and designers. Or do we even need anybody to speak to speak up? You know, it, it, we have in the US and the UK, we have two very active organizations, AIGA in the US and DNAD in this country. Um, should they be active? Should should they be doing something? And and if 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 so, what should they be doing? The the Writers Guild in America, I notice, has taken a very strong position on this in terms of Hollywood. They're saying. You have to, if you're if you're adapting, uh, using AI to adapt scripts and stories, you have to compensate the writer. So anyway, my, my I just idea I want to float here is, what can we do, and who should be helping us, or is it just a question of the government stepping in to try and protect? Uh, obviously, what, what you're talking about is really complicated. We don't have enough time to get into it because so much of it is an economic machine, right? Which Michael rightly says it's it's about capitalism. It's about it's about the arms race between Microsoft and Google, and it's about how people are going to get paid and how jobs and, and job security is going to be you know, mitigated against something that's moving much more quickly than HR departments can handle. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the, for me, the most interesting conversations that are happening around all of this are not in any one discipline, right? So it's the philosophers, it's the scientists, it's the linguists, it's the journalists, it's the conversations about larger issues because it's not just that it's moving quickly it's that the interstitial interconnectedness between all of the things we're talking about today are moving quickly right and yeah. so to come back to what michael writes about so beautifully in his book we really have to come back to this question of of what it is that we do well one of the most interesting arguments i heard against this i mean look governance is going to be about free speech we know this and that's going to get us into all kinds of thorny territory but if we think about the fact that what does what humans do well before we become artists, it's all these other capabilities we have to understand what Michael mentioned earlier and how to interpret, how to align something. I mean, like make sense, like our capacity for reason. Will we really see that in AI? Right. Yeah. So the idea that we're worried about defending artists rights, I think is important, but I think it gets us down a rabbit hole about mm -hmm. authorship and ownership and money. And I'd like to think that human beings possess enormous capacities that far surpass those questions. And I think that's actually a better direction, right? So that the most enlightening things that we're talking about today have to do with not any one of these problems, but how they meet. Mm. Yeah, uh, so it's a, it's a really good point. I think you're right about the complexity of it. I think that the, the the only people that can stick up for the artists um, and the designers are the artists and the designers. I think, you know, we're, we are still uh, autonomous human beings who can work together and educate and collaborate and do what we do. And I think, you know, one of the things that we have to do is, is to kind of decide how we're going to work and how we're going to work together and what we're going to use in order to make the things we want to make and how we're going to communicate, how we're going to put it out there. Now it's quite possible, you know, Google is only a company, Alphabet's only a company. If every or Facebook, you know, if everybody suddenly said, I'm not going to use Instagram anymore, something would change. You know, Meta would have to look at it and think, hang on, something's going on. So it's down to us. And I think that the artist's sensibility, that idea that you can author something or, you know, use reason and then act counterintuitively or counter reasonably to make something you know, more interesting or different than any that has been seen before. Which doesn't our, place as much value on the predictable, but it true. places value yeah. on the and So it's our, our power to 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 um, confuse and con and you know mess ourselves up. I mean, I I just went to see um, Ai Weiwei at um, at the Design Museum. You know, it's extraordinary stuff. It's all analog apart from the the videos he's made, 
you know, it's collections of things. And then I also went to see um, Steve McQueen's Grenfell film, which mm -hmm. is a tracking shot from a helicopter shot, you know, while they were putting the cladding up on the tower block that burned um, to record it before the authorities kind of hid it, mm -hmm. which is such a brilliant act of sort of political and artistic mouse that, that, you know, no, as it goes back to what you said at the beginning, Adrian, that no one's going to, you know, that Duchampian impulse to to confuse ourselves is the is the thing that we need to rely on, I think, you know, and, you know, to do it with with all your heart and soul. Yeah. I like Duchampian better than Scrape. Yeah. Um, I actually think that was a perfect segue I'm to sure. education. I don't. I don't want to. Yes. No. I. I, I, we, I we, thought, we could. I, I think really it's a what, perfect moment. because we're we're all of us educators, and I think like what is the responsibility at this point to have this conversation with our students and with our with our other uh, our colleagues? Because the, we all know that the questions that our students will answer 10, 20 years from now are not the questions that we have now. But I certainly personally feel if I'm hit by a bus tomorrow, I want to go down saying that I think it's important to ask these penetrating questions. And I would hate to see them just worried about authorship and taking credit for the work. Of course, we should get credit for our work. Yeah. But I think to be a, a citizen of the world and to actually pay it forward in a way that's uh, morally conscious is to ask much bigger questions about things like, you know, algorithmic bias. Like I have a lot to say about that. We're not going to get waylaid, but seriously, it's it's we have to ask bigger questions. We just yeah. do. Mm. Yeah. Michael, where does where do we, where does education go in relation to this? I, I just to throw a little firecracker into the mix. I heard about yeah. not an RCA tutor. I'm quick to say, but a, a tutor, uh, a graphic design tutor, speaking to third years, and he, I'm sure it's a he. He told them, um, stop studying the subject immediately. Do something different because you're all. You're all finished. No one needs graphic design anymore That's right. uh, it, it, because of because of AI. You know, get the scissors out is what I'd say. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're sort of trapped between um, or the scalpel. Rather. I think we're kind of trapped, you know, between that the um, what's his name, Boris uh, L. Dagson and um, and Sundar Pinchai. You know, <laughs> the, the artistic impulse and the corporate impulse was sort of the art design schools are trapped between that and in fact you know no disrespect to the i'll say a lot of uh, a lot of art schools have become corporations and kind oh, of business yeah. oriented no, they all have. They, they, rather than yeah. rather than kind of place well, their, their businesses to work out what they think you know yeah. do so i you know i think a, a prompt engineering module is is inevitable but the thing i worry about i suppose is how you would assess that stuff you know i mean what if you use the assessment criteria in your in your master's degree as the prompt for the work that you were going to make <laughs> you, then you close the loop of of um how you get assessed you know there's a tip there for all the students out there yeah yeah that, don't that, copy the yeah, assessment that, criteria that, into, that. into your well, the, um i mean the, the the plagiarism in essay writing and i suppose plagiarism in, yeah. in anything fine art whatever has been a an issue but but it's gone up a level hasn't it with with yeah. the uh, and so the the, the learning models have had to have to introduce new apps to determine whether the yeah. essay has been written by the app that the students are using to avoid detection of their yeah lack of ideas or research. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. But 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 neither of you would say don't study. I said I know. Well, I'm... I say use it, use it, but don't rely on it. You know, it's like yeah. You know, you, one part of the number of things you know it's impossible not to play with it you know and playing yeah. is is a fantastic thing you know i think about alan watts and i think about you know his injunction to 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 just play and play the best you can in whatever situation you are whether you're a bus driver or a or, a, or an artist you know just and just i think about and i think about thinking, thinking through making right so that you know uh, it comes to you as you're making the thing but and also i would like thinking through making to be thinking about things other than making yeah, right? yeah. because this, is a, this world that these students are going to inherit is far more complex than anything i've certainly seen in my lifetime and i think these questions of morality and uh, moral independence and moral indifference are i think it's extremely important i wish they were taught in schools along with prompt engineering yeah i would agree, I agree. I've just seen a very good, and I'm really sorry, everyone. There's so many good questions in here. Yeah. I just wish we could deal with them all. But I've just one's just really sort of jumped out at me, and that's 
uh, by anonymous attendee. Hi there, anonymous. You've said <laughs> no one stuck up for the manufacturers of products, the people who worked on assembly lines when jobs lost to automation. So it's unlikely that anyone will stick up for the designer artist. And I think that's a, that's a very fair and pertinent comment. The way I've seen that um, framed, that, that particular issue is automation in the, uh, in the workplace um, did reduce, massively reduce the number of jobs that were available, um, but it only affected manual work. The difference with AI is it affects cognitive work. So you're doing any sort of cognitive work. If you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, graphic designer, portrait painter. Mm. Cognitive work can now be done, huge swathes of it, whether we think it's good or not, huge swathes of it can be done by, by machines. So no one stood up for the mandal workers. So I don't see anybody standing up for the um, uh, for, 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 for cognitive workers. Now, here she comes. Here's Sheena Calvert. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, Sheena says, not a question, but a comment. Kate Crawford in her book, The Atlas of AI, oh, where's she gone? Yeah, she's gone. Uh, it talks about how our AI is not the technologies of machine learning or large language models, such as ChatGPT, but a description of the meeting point, nexus of social, political, philosophical, ethical, cultural, and other concerns. It is the field set of concerns within which those technologies sit. Jessica reminded us earlier of the importance of context and consequences, and I and I completely agree. So, Sheena, thank you. Yeah, we did define our terms at the beginning. We, we, <laughs> yeah, loosely, loosely. Um, I'm just going to flick through here, and I'm going to ask you both uh, in a minute to sort of sum up, but um, I'm just going to see if there's a few questions here. Uh, someone said an, an autonomous, anonymous attendee is very vocal tonight. Uh, autonomous ND says, where is the role of the gallery and museum here? Its role to interpret this work? There are so few, so few shows based on this. So I just wonder if, I mean, you, you mentioned the uh, AYY show. I mean, I just wonder where artists and galleries are going to museums are going there's to that great show and in, in, there's that great david hockney show in london with music by nico mule yeah, right now, right? That, now. Yeah. i think things like nfts i think i think galleries are, are are redefining their role as framers of these things the same way that uh, these issues these bodies of governance have to reframe their interventions politically and in terms of free speech and and distribution of material mm. but i think everything's getting rethought and that's why just worrying about where credit goes and scraping is, I think, not getting us where we need to go. And it's a much, much bigger issue. I agree. I mean, uh, the, where I saw that Refik Anadol piece was in a gallery in Amsterdam. And um, uh, the things around it were pretty much uh, NFTs. And it, this may be a generational thing, but um, they, they, they seemed really good for sort of a lot of people were taking pictures of them, but with them in the foreground um so you know there'd be a big fluffy orange sculpture uh, which would be the background to their post um but you know for balance uh, that was also happening in the van gogh museum you know there were people standing in front pointing at a van gogh you know so you know the function of galleries uh, is um to to commodify and capitalize on artworks and you know to make them seen and to you know to uh, authenticate the provenance of the of the author and but if we, come back, if we come back to our promptographer, I mean, I, I think I think a big function, particularly, I mean, I work with a lot of photography, so this concerns me. Like, you can revive something. You can, I mean, we, we know that we can make anything, right? It was 2016 that the Rembrandt, the next Rembrandt was made. Do we remember this? It was back in 2016. Yeah. Designed by a computer, created by a 3D printer, 351 years after Rembrandt's death. Uh, and then in 2019, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know about this, to you music, fellas, um, uh, an AI algorithm completed Schubert's Eighth Symphony, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that, that you know, I don't know, um, Rousseau wrote a book about walks and he didn't finish the last walk. I've often thought that would be a really interesting artistic project to do the mm -hmm. Rousseau's last walk, right? There's the idea of the of the sort of um, 
uh, unfinished project that then is is excavated and revived and reinvented in a contemporary idiom, I think is a beautiful kind of exquisite corpse idea. <laughs> With AI, we can do all kinds of things to make, it really can, yeah. but it also can move into new and considerably more worrisome levels of nefarious activity where suddenly it becomes, you know, something that starts a war. I just <laughs> don't think we ask these questions enough. There was a thing today, um... So a, a band has um, made a, a new album. They've called it Aisis. It's <laughs> it's the lost mu music of Oasis. And what they've done is to clone Liam's vocal as um, you know by, by feeding the data set to to AI and got Liam to sing with their band. And it sounds it's 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 sounds like like mid period Oasis. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Right. You know. so the it's online. That's AI the most ringing condemnation of AI I've heard today. Um, <laughs> the fact that Oasis are back well, dead. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of quotes here. Well. They're, they're nice ones to, for us to, to end on because we've only got five minutes left. Um, Maria Koliva says, as a product designer, my role has been gradually shifting from that of a designer into a facilitator. For the right, and this happened, she says, before the rise of AI. That's mostly due to design systems UI toolkits, established best practices, etc. And it's fine, I'm adapting. But my question is, has the shift in paradigm in design started before the AI revolution and AI is just an accelerator? I, 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 I think she's right in, in seeing it, certainly seeing it as an accelerator. So mm. much of what I see in, in AI is a continuation of what's happening anyway. It's just happening at, at, a, at a, on a scale and a level that we've never seen before. Yeah. Where, where do you guys stand on? on and the... speed. Yeah, yeah, speed is the thing, isn't it? I think that, the, yeah, I think that the earlier comment about, you know, AI being this kind of field uh, is is spot on, isn't it? Um, the, you know, the, there's so many things that have, you know, from free, you know, I can't remember when I, first heard about 3D printing, but it was, you know, decade mm. ago, possibly. Um, yeah. Same with AI. You know, these things have been sort of bubbling under for for, for so long. Um, and I think we've been sort of softened up for it as well, in a way. You know, it's mm. it's um, until quite recently, uh, the, the narrative around it wasn't, you know, there were strands of doom, but uh, it wasn't going to be particular because everything it can do in other areas, you know, you mentioned law, you know, case law, but also, you know, if you're talking about reading images or generating images, you know, detection of diseases and, and you know, the deep mind has learned how to fold proteins, which means that, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, human problems uh, are, Perhaps on the verge of being solved, you know. So it is a field. Um, yeah, it, it is a field, but I think something I've come across a few times in in looking into this whole subject is this idea that it's the first inorganic development, and and it, it, the potential for an inorganic existence now exists, and, and that that seems to me to be something that we should be very wary of. Um, you the, what do you mean? What do you mean by inorganic? Well, it's that, not. It, it's not. Uh, you know, metal is mined from the ground, and um, human. Hu, you know, but bio. Everything is biochemical or, or uh, in in hmm. some way organic. Here's something that that is inorganic, and therefore theoretically could move to outer space. I mean, you could you could uh, you could set up an AI community in outer space quite hmm. quite easily. Mm. Um, so I, I just I, I I have a dystopian um, uh, bent. Yeah, a dystopian bent. I I I I do do worry about it. I can also see that you know in things like medicine and healthcare, I can see huge huge yeah. advantages. Exactly. So it was just go on, Michael. There was just one thing I wanted to quickly pick up on. Um, yeah, Scott Jones, who I I think I know. I think Scott was an RCA graduate uh, last year. Um, if it's the same Scott, hi Scott, and he says, once automation takes most jobs, does that leave us to investigate non-commercial endeavors? And I think that's the utopian view. That's the view that is, at last we can do away with drudgery. We can do away with all the things that, that make people uh, unhappy in their work. But it also raises the question is how then do people 
live? How, how, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the monetary side. I'm talking about how do people occupy their time, their energy? How do, how do they survive? It's the utopian dream. Um, and I would love to think that AI was finally our discovery of that. Are we ending? Are we ending on this this dystopian? Well, that's, that's Sorry, my, Sorry <laughs> everyone's finding. I, I, you know, I, I I would like to see. I can say this because I'm old and curmudgeonly about yeah. the kid kids kids out there. I would like to see more concern about having a, a sort of social moral conscience in making the work that uses these new flavors and tools. For example, this question of algorithmic bias is huge. Garbage in, garbage out. You're yeah. young enough to get a job and do this. Okay, maybe it's not gonna be the greatest job in the world where you're not winning awards and, and getting asked to speak, but you know what? The, one's ability to engage socially, environmentally, psychologically, and I think culturally at this moment, it's, an, it's, it's like being a, I don't know, it's like joining the Peace Corps to be a, to be an, a, a maker in this world at this moment. I think there's incredible work to be done uh, by people who are fast and creative and smart and have agile minds. But I think it comes first from all the things we've been saying for the last hour, being human and, and thinking about someone other than yourself, thinking about the impact on our planet, our imperiled planet. I mean, it begins with this algorithmic bias, which is a real problem. Mm. It's just the vituperative problem of, of people just it's bad. It's bad. And, and you know, it's, 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 it, there's racial profiling, there's ageism, there's all kinds of, I think, potentially uh, deeply rooted problems. And you don't have to be a coder to sort them out. You just have to get involved. I would I agree. Very good. I agree. I think Michael, that, do you, you want know, to end on a rising? Yeah, I think we, I, I agree with Jessica. I think the thing, the thing that's going to sound dreadfully hippie, the thing that's can save love can save us, you know, if you kind of, if you educate to do no harm, you know, if you develop positive criticality, you know, in your mind, if you build your library in your head, we choose truth over falsity, you know, harness the speed of iteration to speed up the good, then we'll be okay. You know, we, we've got a world, there was a world of wonder at our fingertips and we can either, uh, you know, aim for the clouds or, you know. I'm glad you mentioned iteration. It's such a seductive thing for, for people who generate lots of things. And I came upon this quote that I have to share with you, which is that George Eliot, the American writer George Eliot said, uh, iteration like friction is likely to generate heat instead of progress. Yeah. Right? We can so easily get seduced by AI and by the rapidity mm. with which we can make things. Are the yeah. things we, are we making, do they really need to be put on the world? Maybe not. No, maybe, maybe. not. <laughs> well, I think that's a suitably um, critical reflection to, to end on. But thank you both so much. It's been really, really interesting. I feel we've only... I nearly said scrape the surface, but I feel we've only scratched the surface. Um, perhaps we'll do this again when um, when, it's, when the whole world changes. So, uh, Joe, are, are you still with us somewhere in the ether? Yes, yes. 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 And have, you got, have you got the results of our yes, of course. Like nail biting perfect. poll? Yes. Um, so these are the results. Oh, should democratically elected governments be more active in regulating AI? So 57% said yes, no, 16% no, and 27% said maybe. And, and I think there's a sort of sub question to that, which really, if we'd thought about it, is can we, you know, can we trust governments to do this? They've famously <laughs> behind the curve in, in, in most matters of technology. Oh, yeah. But it's interesting. At least we, at least there's a sense in which, and I know Italy, Italy has banned chat GTP, hasn't it? And um, I think Canada as well. Mm. So governments are waking up, but as usual, far too slow. Mm. So I think that's a really good point to end. Thank you both so much. It's been really great, and thank you to all the people who put in questions. I it really, it's a, it's a. We should publish it. It's so great. There's so many comments and references. Um, so many, many thanks for that. But um, that's it from us. So I'll um, I'll say goodbye. Joe, do you want to close the proceedings? Oh, no, she got. Yeah, she did. <laughs> I think she's gone. So we should log out too. I think. Are you there? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I hope that you see me here as well. 
Thank you very, very, very much for a very interesting uh, conversation and a lot of discourse and a great debate. And I would like to thank our audience um, for joining us uh, today. If you have any additional questions or if you want to reach out um, to submit your questions, please do um, using the information on the slide. Um, we have more um, in sessions coming up uh, in May. Find information on how to register to our events on the RCA event page. And thank you, uh, everyone, for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks, Joe. Bye, everyone. Bye.